There we go. You can all hear me now all the way in the back? All right. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. I got to say, it's, uh, um, it just feels good. This is me, personally, but it just feels good. I love being in a church that feels like a church, okay? So kind of old and beautiful like this one is, smelling incense. Um, and of course, with the Blessed Sacrament exposed all the more. But, but even if it were later, a half hour later, if I walked into the church, it's just, I don't know, there's something I just want to kneel. Something that brings you to your knees. Such beauty in the senses. Today at noon, I had the Mass over at St. Lawrence. Beautiful church, too. You all have a lot of beautiful churches. That's, that's for sure. I'm not crazy about the newer ones, the big, you know, like auditoriums. I'm probably getting, getting in trouble saying all this. Okay, anyway, thank you all for coming out uh, tonight, our second night of parish mission. Do you remember what the word is we're focusing on tonight? <laughs> Amen, that's right, that's right. What was the word last night? Yes, that is correct. Now, before we head into our amen, a couple of housekeeping things in addition. Um, first, um, as you leave, you'll have an opportunity, if you'd like, to take something that all Catholics love, which is why we bring them envelopes. Okay? <laughs> now, they're on the tables on the side and the back. Now, let me tell you just really quickly the two purposes for the envelope. The first, obviously, is the support for the work that we do as Vincentian Parish Missioners. So we go out and we do this. We ask the parish that we go to, since COVID has happened, for a donation of $750. Um, and then, and of course, that doesn't cover much, but it covers enough. And then at the end of the evenings of mission, we ask the people that we've come to serve if you can also help and support our ministry. And that's how we do what we do. And the reason is because St. Vincent de Paul, our founder, said that when we go out as missioners, we need to go out as Jesus himself went out in ministry, which is you go, you serve, and at the end of it, you simply ask for help. You don't charge people for curing their blindness or this or that. You just, at the end of it, say, hey, do you have a bed I can sleep in? I, actually, I got that, so I don't need that. But Jesus said, you know, food that I can eat so I can get to the next village and the next town. And that's how we do what we do. So your kindness and generosity, and for that, I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Thank you for that consideration. And I need you to know this. It's a beautiful part of this that half of all the missions that we do as Vincentians in a year, in a calendar year, half of all those missions are saved for mainly rural, very poor, poor parishes, of which there are many. These are places that no one else will go to do parish missions or retreats or any of this stuff because they literally have nothing. And it breaks my heart. I, I go to these places. And, you know, they have the little downtown, the little main street. Everything is boarded up. You know, it was a thriving town. But like so many, industry moved out and the young people moved. And now there's just a smattering of mainly older people. You know, and this is where they grew up and lived. And, uh, but they have nothing. <laughs> it's just, it's hard to see. But what a beautiful thing to be able to come to do this for them. And when we go, we don't bring these. We bring other envelopes that just ask for their prayers. We don't even talk about money. We don't ask for money. Because they don't have it. Um, but for the places that do, this is how we get to those places as well. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, you're going to get us there, literally. So anyway, for that consideration, thank you, thank you so deeply. Now, secondly, for the envelope, whether there is a contribution or not, please hear this, is a collection of your prayers. 
So this is a beautiful and powerful thing that we do. We go out when we, and we ask people that we serve, if you'd like for me and my brother priest with whom I live to pray for whatever it is you're praying for, we will do that. Now, I live in a house in St. Louis with 21 other Vincentian priests. Hell. No, just kidding. No, no it's brown. But I live with 21 other guys, and we do different kinds of ministries. But we have a chapel, big chapel on the first floor. We have morning prayer, we have mass, and we have evening prayer during the course of every day. And in the front of our altar, we have a glass urn, our prayer urn. That's where all the prayers from the people that we serve, who they entrust to us, we put those prayers in that urn, and every day at Mass, we lift it physically up to the heavens, praying for whatever it is you're praying for. Where two or three are gathered, there's more than that. And, uh, oh, we get such beautiful emails and notes from people. It's a powerful thing. So if you'd like for us to do that for you, please just write it on the top of the envelope or get a sheet of paper if it's too small and then put it in there. Whether there's money or not, that's not, this isn't about the money part. Um, just put it in there. And there's a collection of the envelopes these uh, tomorrow evening. So you can just throw it in there. I take this back home and I open every single one, read, and then place your prayers at our altar. Beautiful. Two of the 21 priests with whom I live, they're retired, older guys, but their ministry are, is still very active. They've changed ministries, and now they have a ministry of prayer, is what they call it. And what they do is they spend hours every day in our chapel lifting into prayer those petitions that stand at our altar. They're warriors of prayer <laughs> and holy guys. Oh my, oh my God, put me to shame. So anyway, that's tomorrow night. Are there any questions about that at all? Okay, beautiful. So the envelopes are there. If it is a check, someone asked me earlier, if it's a check, that's the information's there as well. And if it is a check, all we ask is that it have five zeros. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay. So folks, tonight we're going to start with amen. But I got to tell you first about this old lady that I heard about. Now, she was old, like 60. No, just kidding. No, I just turned 60, so uh, that ain't happening. So anyway, an old lady comes to Mass one Sunday, and an usher greets her at the front and says, Hello, good morning, ma'am. Where can I help you get a pew to sit? And the old lady says, Oh, Father, I'd like to sit all the way in the front pew, please. And the usher says to her, Oh, ma'am, no, no, not at this Mass, you don't. The pastor has this Mass and he will put you to sleep. Don't sit in the front. And the woman steps back and says, Sir, do you know who I am? <laughs> and he says, No. She says, I'm the pastor's mother. And he says to her, Well, ma'am, do you know who I am? She says, No. He says, Good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> okay. Anyway, folks, thank you for being here. Now, what I want to do is ask you if you did your homework. Did you do your three homework? Okay, yeah. Was it easy, hard? <laughs> it better be easy the first night if you can't come up with three things for which you're grateful. So, we'll have at it. So keep at that, and remember all new things that you put on that list. And let me tell you what's going to happen. This is the beauty of this exercise. The first few, you know, four or five evenings, it'll be relatively simple, but because you can't double up, night 9, 10, 12, 17, you're going to start to struggle with what to put because you've kind of emptied the coffers of what you're grateful for, or at least what you think you are. That's when the beauty of the thing kicks in. Because then you start opening your mind and your thoughts. Well, what, what am I grateful for? Yes, family, yes, life, yes, love, but you put all those. Well, what else? The smile of that little kid today 
at Walmart. Oh, that was so beautiful. Put a smile on my face. Thank you, Lord. The most simplest of things. Stick it up on that mirror. And you know what's going to happen in about three weeks? Maybe a week or so before Christmas? Your friends and people you know, maybe people at work, are going to start coming to you and saying things like, are you feeling okay? <laughs> You're going to be like, yeah. It's like, oh, you don't, you don't look so good. Are you sure? Are you sick? Yeah, no. And they're going to keep asking you that, and you're going to wonder, what is it? And I'll tell you what it is. You're not going to be looking good. Because every morning in that bathroom, when you're getting ready for work, <laughs> and you can't see yourself because of all the sticky notes. <laughs> Your hair is going to look horrible. You're going to be misshaven. And that's the point of it. Because all you're going to see is gift, <laughs> treasure, beauty. And it's not going to be you. It's going to be all this other goodness poured into your life. Stick at that. It's a beautiful thing. So tonight we're going to transition into amen. So we're talking about what are the words that will get us to everlasting life. Tonight is amen. We cannot move where we desire to go without prayer. It is the, the vehicle that moves us to Jesus. Gratitude is the thing that turns us the right way, right? Someone gives you something great, you're going to turn to that giver. Thank you, as you look them in the eye. So the more you see the treasure and gifts in your life, the more you're going to be turned to the giver. But now we want to get to the giver. Now let me give you an analogy, one that means a great deal to me, reminding me how important it is and what happens in my life when I am turned the right way. And that is the sunflower. Now, I love them. I mean, who doesn't, right? They're gorgeous. You know, they rise high and above every other flower. Their heads are beautiful, yellow and orange. Now, this one's fake. $12.99 at Hobby Lobby. But, you know, they're beautiful. And I have one at the end of my bed at home where I live and in my office and in my little kitchenette thing for good reason. And that reason happened to me a good number of years ago when I was driving out to a mission in Kansas and I came across a field of sunflowers. Never seen that before. I've seen them in gardens. But have you seen a field of them? You know, tens of thousands of these things opening up. It looks like the field is on fire. You know, the, there was a breeze blowing through their little petals, their little fingers were kind of moving, they were dancing. It looked ablaze. It was amazing. I mean, so much so I got out of my car. I pulled off to the side of the interstate, got on top of the car, and I just sat there gazing out. You know, I, I was taking in deep breaths, trying to absorb all of this gorgeousness. I don't know, it was, gosh, it was lovely. Well, anyway, I get to the mission, and at some point I'm talking about this experience, driving there, and the sunflowers, and people at the mission there in Kansas started telling me all about them. They're like, oh yeah, Father, because I didn't know this, Kansas is the sunflower state. Did you know that? Yeah. So supposedly they know all about sunflowers, you know, whatever. But anyway, so they started talking to me, and they're like, oh yeah, hey, Father, did you know this? Which I didn't. That every sunflower around the world begins every day facing east. And as the sun rises and moves across the sky, the sunflowers follow. They track the movement of the sun from east to west, physically twisting and moving their big heads around, over, and then when the sun dips beyond the horizon, 
they move down and during the course of the night they shift themselves turn lift their heads and there they are at dawn poised ready to receive the sun again and then there they go, twist and turn, follow the sun east to west. Every day, every week, every month, every year. Do you know that? It's amazing. And I was a little incredulous, you know, and so I was like, oh, wow, that's nice. And then that night I got onto YouTube to see if it was true, right? <laughs> because anything you want to know is on YouTube. And everything you don't want to know is on YouTube. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I did a search, sunflowers, movement, sun, whatever. Tons of videos. Check it out. Time lapse, so like a one-minute video over the course of a day. And you can see the field of sunflowers. They're all kind of choreographed, choppy, but there they are, turning, moving, drinking in all they can of the sun. That is why they are so beautiful. We tend to think something like this, oh wow, somehow internally, that's just who they are. Like saints in our tradition, well, they were just special people. Like they had something we don't have. Bad, that's wrong. See, one lady told me at the end of the conversation, I said, wow, they're really amazing, these sunflowers. And she said something to me. It was just off the cuff. She didn't think anything of it. But it struck me so deeply, spiritually, which is why now I have these all over my room. Wow, they're really amazing. And she said to me, yeah, yeah, yeah Father, you know, they really are. They're always turning themselves to what makes them most beautiful. They're always turning themselves to what makes them most beautiful. They're not beautiful. They receive their beauty from the sun. And somehow, stitched into their DNA, they know this. So what do they do all day, every day? They turn to the sun. And in return, the sun blesses them with the warmth, with nutrients, with the beauty that grows within them. Anthony, Anthony, <laughs> that boy was turned the right way. And look at him. He turned out to be quite beautiful server of the year. We have story after story of people, and many of you, I bet, could attest to this very thing in your life. But yeah. When I am truly turned to the Lord, I feel the blessing that's been given. And scripture tells us, Isaiah 45, turn to me and be safe, for I am the Lord your God. Drugs? No. Guns? No. Turn to me. I will wrap you in safety. Psalm 58, let your face shine upon us, O Lord, and we shall be saved. Only you. Psalm 34, look to him. Look to him that you may be radiant with joy. I mean, and on and on. It's all over scripture. Turn to me. I will lead you. 
prayer is that gift that moves us to the source of that beauty. Now, we can pray in many different ways. But I'd like to focus just the remaining two hours on the prayer of Eucharist. This table. Now, I always thought that well, you can only have mass in a church with a table with bread and wine and the missal and all that. And I found out some years ago that, you know what? That's really not true. Okay. I don't know who did that, but slipping five bucks. Okay. Let me tell you about an experience of prayer I had a while back that was so powerful, but so weird at the same time. It was with a bald man in a Walmart bathroom. I was in there because I was off a bike ride, and so I was washing my hands. I was, you know, in shorts and sweaty shirt. I was gross. And the bathroom was empty, which I love an empty public bathroom. Okay, that's my favorite. I'll even wait to get it empty before I go in. But that's just my psychosis. Anyway, so I'm in the bathroom, and I'm washing my hands, thinking I'm in there all by myself, when I hear a flushing sound. And suddenly, a bald guy comes out of the stall. A young guy, probably, well, kind of like you. <laughs> um, you know, maybe 25, whatever he was, 28. Anyway, comes out of the stall, moves behind me, turns, and then washes his hands by the sink right next to me. Now, I have to tell you, this is Walmart, so you know how everything is bigger than it needs to be. Well, the bathroom, there's like 15 sinks, right? And a big plate glass mirror stretched across all 15. And I'm at the last one. He comes, turns, and uses the one right by me. Now, you don't do that, okay? I wanted to tell him, excuse me, sir, you have 14 things to choose from. I'm an American. I like my space, right? Anyway, so we're washing. When the guy, the bald guy, says to me, now remember, I'm nasty t-shirt. My hair is messed up, my shorts and all this. The guy turns and he says, excuse me, sir, can I ask you a personal question? Now, remember, we're in a bathroom. <laughs> A Walmart bathroom, okay, and so I was a little creeped out, and I said, well, I'd rather you didn't, <laughs> you know, and I thought, let's just, Ron, just get your hands clean, let's get out of here, and he says to me, doesn't, he doesn't even hear it, he says to me, will you pray for me, I've lost my way, yeah, you say aw, oh, but, you know, <laughs> at that moment, in a bathroom, I'm thinking, what? It took me off guard. Now, I could see if I was wearing my clerics and all that. That's a different story. But he didn't know who I was or anything, and just out of the blue, and it didn't make sense. And I'm thinking in my mind, is this a joke? You know, or am I being set up? You know, are, are we being filmed? Is there something going on? And all of this in the space of a nanosecond. You know, what do you say? And I thought, well, maybe he's got a gun, you know, or a knife. I watched too much CSI, I think. But anyway, so I said to him, which was true, but I said to him, I'm sure I will, which I meant. In fact, in my head, I was thinking, I'm going to write him up and put him at our altar. But I thought, just in case this is something weird going on, I'm not doing it here. So I said, uh, yeah, sure, I will. So I was done, and so I moved behind him to get the towel to go. And as I moved behind him, he swings around, grabs my arm, my wrists, and plants my hands onto his bald head as he bows down before me and says, no, no, now, please, now, as he forced my hands there with a tight grip. 
oh my gosh. And I thought, wow. But when he bowed down in front of me like that with my hands on his head, I saw his tears. They were hitting the floor. And I could see, no, this isn't, this is real. A hurting man. And so I prayed for him. I was praying for him as he was bowed there. And I thought to myself, wow, I hope no one comes into this bathroom <laughs> because this is not good. I can see us in the mirror. It's just not good. When, of course, the door opens up, some guy comes in, pauses, sees us, says, oh, and goes back out. So I was like, okay, let's close the prayer down. You know, we're done. So I said the word that we have for tonight, amen. And I started to pull my hands away. And as I started to do that, I felt his grip go tighter, holding them just there. And he says it again, please, please, I've lost my way as tears continued to flow. The guy that came in comes back in. This is moments later, followed by the biggest, baddest security guard I have ever seen. Big, tall, like seven foot tall. Big, it was a big black guy. Seven foot tall, huge. Had the, he didn't have a gun, but he had everything else. Uh, you know. And he comes in, steps in. The man says, there they are, officer, and points to us. The bald guy says, please, he's praying for me. He's praying for me. When the black guy says, oh, well, I'll pray for you too. And with that, he steps up and he places his big, gigantic hands on top of my hands on top of the guy. And there we are. I'm looking at us in the mirror. You know, a bald guy, a black guy, and a priest, <laughs> and we're praying in a Walmart bathroom. O-M-G. <laughs> the most unlikely of places where God puts people before us. Now, I wish I had time, but I don't. But I learned an awful lot about myself in that encounter. Some things I did not like and don't like to see. For example, I wish I had the courage and the, well, let's say faith, that when someone approaches me and asks for prayer, no matter the consequences, yes, let's do this without worrying about what people might think of me. That's turned the wrong way. That's not a good way. That's like that last servant from our story last night. That's burying the treasure. Learned that about myself. I'm getting better, praying for that. But what I also learned is that Eucharist can happen in more places than just a church. Because what we did there together was Eucharist, I think. It was calling upon the name of God as we do at this very table, asking God's Spirit to bless and to make holy what is before us. You know, to transform this into something more beautiful, something holy, something that doesn't cry anymore, and on and on. I want to get back to it later at the end. Eucharist in the classic sense, is what Jesus gave us so 
so that he could be as present to you and me today as he was when he walked the earth. To understand and appreciate what happens when we're gathered in his name around this table is the only way is to understand who Jesus was and why he came. Right? I mean, that just makes sense. If what comes from this table is Jesus, then who was Jesus, and why did he come, and why does he continue to come into my life? Well, it's not a trick question. It's a kind of a rather easy one, in fact, because we have all of these beautiful examples in Scripture of why Jesus came and what he did. And why he came and what he did was nothing more than transform the people that came before him into something more beautiful. Bartimaeus, the blind guy, what does he do? He comes before Jesus and anyone who steps before him, no matter who it is, no matter how important, how severe or minor the thing is about them, Jesus steps up and responds. I want to see. I want my darkness turned to light. Holds him, blesses him, lifts him, turns him, and as he walks from that encounter with the Lord, the very thing he desired most in his life came to pass. The clouds, the darkness. The woman at the well, the poor girl, young as she was, filled with depression and everything else, comes to the well, ostracized probably from many in her own village, every day, same thing, no joy, when one day she meets Jesus at the well. Doesn't even know it's him. Just some, you know, guy who's got a nasty beard and, you know, torn clothes, and it's like, oh, who are you? And what did she do that changed her life? Stayed at the well. Jesus asks her, basically, how are you doing? How are you? Well, you know, actually, not so good. Really? Why? What, what's happening? Well, and then the more she started pulling up her own brokenness and hurt, the more Jesus was accepting it and holding her transforming her in that light because she was turned to him and the more he took from her, the more she gave. And in that encounter at the well with the Lord, magically, weirdly, unbeknownst to her, her life started to change. Joy began to creep in. So much so that at the end of that encounter, it says her, she drops her bucket. She doesn't care about that anymore because she was the bucket. She was being filled with this life-giving water that was making her so beautiful. Running back to the village. The lepers who come physically impaired, thrown out of the village because of their sinfulness, and they come to Jesus, what does he do? The same thing. What do you want me to do? Just like that, despite the risks, holds them, blesses them, as they leave that encounter, their life is changed. Over and over again. And that promise of Jesus in their lives is one that he did not take with him when he raised to his father. He left that for us, this that we call Eucharist. This is the gift that Jesus gives to us 
where we need to be held, blessed, transformed into something more. And friends, I can tell you, because of my own personal story, the power of this gift. The first half of my life, well, first third of my life, was awful. I hated myself, literally hated myself, for a whole number of reasons. The main one being, especially moving into late grade school and then high school, it just became unbearable, the hatred that I felt. And a lot of it was because of physically. I, at that time in high school, third year in high school, I weighed 310 pounds. I was huge. I was a freak, I was told. I was being laughed at and mocked and ridiculed at a time in your life, you know, where acceptance is so important, belonging. And I was an animal. People making fun of me, pointing at me, laughing at me. On top of that, I had a horrible stutter, really bad stutter. I went to two or three different speech therapists my mom and dad sent me to, and after a period of time, they all said the same thing, I'm sorry, there's just nothing more we can do for him. He'll have to learn to live with this. And it was bad. I couldn't, like, going to the store, I'm going to the more ridicule and more laughter. Everyone, of course, thought I was stupid. And I started feeling just like that. And then one month, it all came to the fore. The only friend I had, Andy Hewitt, was killed and was struck and killed by a drunk driver. My dad's uh, father, my grandfather, came to live with us in the house we lived in from the East Coast. And it turns out he was a horrible alcoholic. And that disease just brought such darkness and hatred and yelling and everything else to our home, me and my two brothers, my mom and dad. Started breaking everything apart. And I couldn't take it. My older brother Bob got into drugs, was thrown into jail. And it was like my whole life was just crumbling in on me. And I needed to get out. I couldn't take this. And it was 1981, and it was a Saturday night, and I tried to take my own life. Um, sorry. I tried to take my own life because I thought to myself, this is the only way. There's no hope anywhere else. It's just going to get worse. I can't live with this. And I grabbed a bottle of gin and pills. My dad was an oncologist. My mom's a nurse. We had pills. Grabbed a fistful of pills. I went to the barn in the back, went up into the hayloft that Saturday night, took the end of my life, and I lie on the ground, my back, and I couldn't do it. All night long, sobbing, trying to shove the pills into my mouth, and I just couldn't do it. Everything was shaking. I was crying. The next day was Sunday, and I was at Mass, and I was in the back pew, and that Mass changed my life. It did. It, it turned me. It really did. And one of the main reasons for that is because of what I heard during that Mass. Now, I've been to many Masses before. I knew what was going on. I've heard the stuff. I've said the prayers. Nothing. But at this time, when I was at the very bottom and so broken and so alone, the 
it's like everything just opened up. I started to understand for the first time I need this. You know, and these were the words. It was John 6, 53. You've heard this. You know this. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. I don't know why that Sunday morning that those words haunted me and entered me in a space that they never had before. But there I was sitting in that pew realizing God is calling me something more. What I realized that Sunday morning is that I didn't need God to take my weight away or my stutter away. I didn't need God to take the nightmare of my life away. What I needed, what I needed was a God to hold me and to lead me through it, a companion on this nightmare. Yes, through the valley, but to something, a banquet waiting. And that day, I gave it to Jesus. Just as the woman at that well, unbeknownst to her, did, just as Bartimaeus did, who knew very well, I want to see, and I know, Lord, that you can touch and turn my life. That's what I heard. That's what I received. For the first time in my life, it's what I believe. And then every day, after that day, for the longest time, I went to Mass. And what I did, I imagined my life, especially the darkest parts of it, that I didn't know how to manage, that I didn't know how to get out of, where I felt lost. Those parts of my life, I came to Mass, and I imagined placing that right here on this table. Right with the bread and right with the wine, this part of my life that needed the same power and the same blessing that Jesus did. And I believed and I absolutely trusted the Lord's promise that I will do this for you. Now, I didn't know what the this was. But all I knew is that I would be lifted up. And sure enough, because I'm not saying that God is the new Jenny Craig. Okay, I'm not saying that, yes, I lost a great deal of weight, and yes, miraculously, literally miraculously, I lost the stutter. God didn't make me skinny. God transformed the way I saw myself. I saw and believed what I saw and heard from the people around me, that I was stupid, that I was fat, that I was worthless, that I was a joke. And everything I did to try and get out of that, it didn't work. Amazing what God can do. Place it on his table and trust. And I know sometimes it's hard to do, isn't it? Because the one question 
that I've learned from that experience years ago was before I walk into a church to ask the question, where am I hungry for God? Before you even sit into a pew, know what the answer to that is. Are you hungry for God to fill you? That's what this is. Is it not a meal? Have you ever gone to a beautiful meal where you're full? You don't want to be there. But have you gone to a beautiful table filled with sumptuous food and your stomach is growling and you're hungry? Oh, oh, man, you are so present. Of course you are. I was really, really hungry years ago in that back pew. Thankfully, I've never been that hungry since. I know it. I feel it. Hungry for God right now in your life. It's an important question because I think that so often we come into church and we come to Mass and we sit in the same pew, don't we? Sit in the same pew. You know, we stand at the same time. We say the same prayers. And then everything kind of becomes rote and monotonous. And then suddenly we're really not present to what's happening. You know, you're sitting in the pew. I kind of know how it goes. So you're sitting in the pew and Mass is going on. You're thinking to yourself, how do they change those lights? <laughs> That's a tall dude. Oh, let's see, what for dinner tonight? Oh, whoa. Oh, who is she? Ah, okay. Amen. You know, or, or whatever, your, your mind's drifting, it's going every which way, and then suddenly you're back out in your car an hour later and off you go. I know, it happens to us, or at least to me as a priest, even presiding at Mass sometimes, where you're not truly present to what's before you. We're human, we're broken. I get that. But I try and ask myself that question every time I either start to say Mass or come to Mass. I hungry for you, Lord. Where am I lost without you? Where do I need you to hold me, fill me, to transform me into something more beautiful? I love Pope Francis. And I love one of the things he talks about on Eucharist. He's got this great line. He says, each and every time we receive Eucharist, the risen Christ appears to us. We get to touch him. He touches us. What more? What more do you want than that? And then he says this, I love this. The Eucharist is not a prize for the perfect. It is a powerful medicine and nourishment for the weak. Yeah, I know that. Been there. It's not a prize because you live a great life. The nourishment we need, the medicine to help us live that life, to lift us when we're down, to hold us when we're lonely, to feed us. So friends, I'll end there. Where is it in your life right now that you'd like to place on that altar? Every time you come to Mass, think about placing it there. I can tell you, 
without question. Good things happen. And I know this if for no other reason than this. I'm going to end, but this. A few years back, a couple years ago, two years ago, I was on a layover. I was going to my brother's for Christmas, I don't know, something. And I was on a layover in Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. So I had all my stuff. I had, you know, my jeans and hiking boots and all this kind of stuff. I was ready to go vacation. And tons of people, pre-COVID, tons of people, and I'm just looking at stores, people everywhere, when a tap comes onto my shoulder. And I look around, and it's this guy, this businessman, young guy. Um, he had a suit coat and tie, a little attache case and all this. But the thing that kind of made me pause was his hair was pulled all the way back, and then it was up in a man bun. You know what that is? You know, like a... It's all tied up into this big knot. <laughs> now, not that that's weird. Well, I guess it is. I don't know. From where I, I mean, not that it's wrong. It's just a little weird. I don't see it a lot. So I was like, oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. <coughs> and he says, <coughs> excuse me. He goes, he goes, this might be a really weird question. He goes, but um, do you live in, in Birmingham? And I said, England? <laughs> and he says, no, Alabama. And I go, oh, no. I said, I live in St. Louis. But my brother, I get this a lot, because me and my brother look a lot alike. And I go, no, but my brother lives in And as I'm saying this, the guy is embarrassed right now. Because you know how that goes, where it's like, Kathy, hey, Kathy. Oh, God, you're not Kathy. Oh, God, you know. And uh, so I'm like, no, that wasn't, no, that's my bro. Oh, okay. And I could see his face turn red, you know, and he backs up. He goes, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. But as he was pulling away, there was something. And I said, wait, wait. I said, this might be a weird question to you, but were you ever bald? And a smile went up on this man's face, and he said to me this. That was me in that bathroom. That's all he said. I, I get goosebumps. This is years, well, two years ago, but I get goosebumps thinking and talking about it now. That was me in that bathroom. I mean, my... And do you know what I said? Oh, my God, I felt so stupid. I said, what? You got hair. <laughs> you know, I'm like, what? Um, who says that? But I was just so, like, discombobulated. It's like, what? Is this a joke? And, and he said to me, he goes, he goes, that was me in the bathroom. And I go, wow, you got hair. And he's like, I got a lot more than that. And he went on, now he was getting a flight too, and so, and there's people, so he still doesn't know I was a priest or any of that, because we didn't have time to really talk, maybe 30 seconds. But he, oh, he had the biggest smile on his face, and he said a little bit about his situation there. He was, um, he was down there, he was in a bad way, as he kept saying, drugs. And he was married, had two little baby girls at the time. He was thrown out. Evicted, not evicted, but thrown out, had a restraining order against him from his wife because he was becoming violent, living literally on the streets. He would go in periodically to the Walmart to clean up in the toilet, right, water, because he was so embarrassed to do it at the sink. And then periodically he would go to the dumpster behind the Taco Bell and get stuff to eat. Which, by the way, is the same as eating in the Taco Bell. <laughs> okay, but, but anyway, but, so that's what it was. He, he would eat out there and then clean up. Oh my gosh, now he's a ad executive, a marketing executive for Procter & Gamble and lives in Phoenix, Arizona with his wife and his two girls. Praise the Lord, right? Yeah, honest to God. You know, we're people God sends to us and what we can do for them, but also the power of prayer. You know, when we were there, that's what did this. It was that power of Eucharist right on him, that prayer over him. I mean, I know it was mainly the black guy, but still, 
I mean, I want to take my credit, you know? So friends, don't ever second guess that and that desire. You have a desire for the Lord, absolutely. But you know, Jesus has a deep desire for you. Hold you. Transform what he created into this. Where are you hungry? Thank you for coming tonight, my friends. Tomorrow night, we're going to close out our mission with our last word, goodbye. And we're going to be reflecting on the great power of God's Holy Spirit. So if gratitude turns us to the Lord, and the prayer moves us and transforms us closer to his heart, what does the Holy Spirit do? Really important. <laughs> really important. And I learned that too. I'm going to share with you. So thank you for coming tonight. We're going to close out. Uh, don't forget, grab your prayer envelopes on the way out if you want. And let's end with our mission prayer. Let's stand together. Lord Jesus, transform me into yourself. May my hands be your hands. May my words be your words. Grant that everything I do may serve only to glorify you. I pray your Holy Spirit watch over and guide me. Keep me turned to you and grateful in all things so that I may live my life with you and for you and truly say with St. Paul, I live now, not I, but Christ lives in me. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God shower you with blessing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us go in peace. And thanks be to you. See you tomorrow. God bless you.